Hey, welcome everybody. Glad that you could join us today. Welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. Our topic today is DevOps impact on governance, risk, and compliance within the financial industry. It's a great topic. I know that uh, governance, compliance, uh, regulatory uh, aspects of all of our companies and businesses are very much uh, of topic, and especially about DevOps and how it can or maybe has helped. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by CloudBees. My name is Mitch Ashley. I will serve as both an analyst who's done some of the work on this research as well as host for today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording the webinar, so all everyone that's participating, signed up for attending, uh, we'll get a recording of the webinar. You'll get an email with a link to that as well as a copy of the slide. So you'll be able to see that. We also want to note that at the end of today's webinar, we'll be giving away four Amazon gift certificates. So please hang out, stay stay with us and, and find out if you're one of our uh, winners. Also, my uh, co-speaker today, who I'll introduce in just a moment, both of us really enjoy interacting with the audience and responding to questions and reactions and thoughts that you have as we explore this topic and some of the research that's been done. So we appreciate if you would join us. Uh, there's a chat function. You can type into the public chat, comments, thoughts, et cetera. And also there's a Q&A tab just uh, to the right of your screen. And that's a great place to enter questions. And we'll, we will, of course, uh, add those into our dialogue and our conversation. Now, we will have some slides today. Most of that's just to present the data to you so you can see some of the research that was done. And uh, we'll be talking about some of the meaning or interpretation of the and meaning behind that data. So let's move on to our topic, DevOps impact on governance, risk, and compliance in the finance industry. It's my great pleasure to be joined by Tim Johnson. Tim is Director of Product Marketing at CloudBees. Welcome, Tim. Hey, thanks, Mitch. Glad, happy to be here. Good to be good to be on with you. Uh, let's let's do this. Let's by let's start by way of an introduction. Just have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about CloudBees for folks that don't know about CloudBees. Okay. Well, we're in the uh, DevOps tool space. We have a platform for software delivery, and uh, my role is in product marketing around the um, um, CDRO release orchestration capability that we have in the product, as well as a new product we announced around uh, compliance. I've been in product marketing for a long time for uh, a number of players um, in the security space like Surf Control, Google, Blue Coat, and so forth. But I've been in the DevOps space for about five or six years now. And uh, rapidly changing space it is. <laughs> no indeed, doubt. indeed, it's, it's fun. And and what what I what I like about it, I mean, the technology is cool. But one of the things that I like about it is if you're doing DevOps right, you can fundamentally change people's lives, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, we're living in the digital world, so the the more quickly and more reliably we can get out quality software, all the better, right? And meet compliance requirements. Uh, but, you know, I'd love to have you just say briefly, uh, you're, you're very knowledgeable about the compliance regulatory industry. And I'm curious, does that come from your security background or that's just been part of your sort of product experience across different companies? Uh, it, it's been intertwined. I mean, the, the security and compliance go hand in hand. In fact, a colleague of mine just earlier today asked, what's the difference between the two? And and, and security is is protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your digital assets from either bad actors, both internal and external, or unintended consequences like manual processes and human error, unintentional human error, and stuff like that. So that's security. The compliance is is closely related, but it's it's where you have to um assert and prove that you followed the set of rules and regulations and policies that either come from an internal source or an external source that you've done what you said you're going to do or what they say you're supposed to do that you have done that and you got the way and you have the way to to prove that mm -hmm. um and so yeah i was in security for a long time but compliance is always kind of there in the background and um one company i was at years ago when hipaa and graham leach bliley 
first came out, it was, oh, what do we do with all this stuff? So, you know, you go through the your product kit, you read the regulations. Yes, I have read the HIPAA regulations. Uh, and try to figure out, okay, how does this, how do what we have in the kit apply to this? And how can this thing here be a problem? And how do companies try to deal with it now? And how does this make it better for them? So mm -hmm. it's always been there. It's, a, it's an interesting puzzle. And, and with the how global everything is and changing technologies and changing environments, changing political landscapes, you know, the the number of regulatory agencies that any any company of any size has to deal with, especially multinational, is just mind boggling. Well, it uh, I think it's, it says a lot and just to share with our audience. Um, and by the way, feel free to jump in on the public chat and welcome to folks that have done that already. Welcome from California. Paul has already jumped in and Cody from Austin. Um, yeah, the fact that we're talking about software, we're talking about DevOps and compliance is, is a great topic. And it is very topical. A lot of people are discussing this and, and have hopes or desires or maybe dreams about how DevOps and automation can help um, help make meeting the compliance requirements for regulations and internal policies and practices easier, which I believe is in part why and to share with the audience, this research that uh, I'm sharing with you today was commissioned by uh, CloudBees. The research was conducted by TechStrong Research uh, Analyst Group, and that uh, that I'm principal with. And uh, but but the fact that a DevOps company would commission this kind of research says a lot. Well, the the part of it is that um, if you're to, to us, if you can't, if, 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 if auditing efforts and compliance efforts are hard for your organization, you're not doing DevOps right at, at, at the fun, at, at, at the base level of it. To me, if, if you have hundreds of people devoted full time to just doing audit and compliance work, um, if, a demand letter, say a sweep letter from FINRA shows up and, oh my God, we got to go prove all this stuff. And it's a drop everything and all hands to the deck and it's three weeks of, of nothing else getting done. That tells us you're not doing DevOps right at the end of the day, because if you're doing DevOps right, you, you have all this automation and automation is simply a description of what you think you're going to do or what you are supposed to do or what you understand you are supposed to do and those are all that automation is is built with the you know a couple of things efficiency but also security and compliance in mind so mm -hmm. if you have that automation set up right then you can even have a self-service service if you will uh, for audit and compliance. So your auditors and, and compliance people can just go pull whatever reports they want themselves and not have to tap anybody on the shoulder. And hey, can you go rebuild this or re recreate this build from months ago or any, any other hoo-ha like that? So if compliance and security is a non-event for you, then you're doing DevOps right. Well, and, and I kind of to parallel with that, I've also said as an analyst, there's so much data exhaust because now we have much more <laughs> automation. And if, yes. that, if that exhaust is just going out into the ether, if you will, um, <laughs> and not being utilized, there's just one of the greatest areas that it can make a difference is in compliance. And now we have some data to say whether that's happening. So let, let's jump into the research. Okay. Now, this has been research we've been doing over the past, I would guess about four months or so. Um, and we've been focused specifically on industry verticals. So this is data that's coming out of people who are doing DevOps in various different roles, individual contributor, leadership, et cetera, but primarily around software and the process. And some responders are regulatory folks or compliance folks internally. Others are software developers, software managers, leaders, et cetera. So we were focusing on financial industry, financial services, of course, so banks and other types of services that go with this. And I think one of the things we first wanted to just take an assessment of is kind of where are you on your journey 
And of course you could break this up by the size of company and, you know, different aspects of, of where folks are on their journey. Right. And I always, I have to constantly remind myself, like not everybody is where you are, Mitch, with DevOps, right? Some folks are getting started. Some folks have been doing it longer. Some folks have taken it farther than, than, you know, I necessarily have or groups that I talk with. So it is a wide spectrum. Now in this particular uh, study kind of group of folks, given that we're talking about industries that are regulated, that's one of the things we wanted to know. I remember talking about this with you, Tim, is, is that driving up the adoption of DevOps because of automation and, you know, repeatability, et cetera. And uh, to, to a good degree, that's borne out in the data here. You look at 34%, 34.6, 33, 25. So you're really less than 8%, you know, are not on that journey somewhere. And only 25 are on the starting blocks. Uh, everyone else is sort of in that middle to, you know, we've really acceler accelerated our adoption uh, across projects. So um, in intuitively, I was hoping to see this. It's interesting that that's what we are seeing. Yeah, I, I part on, on one level, I'm a little dismayed that there's 8% that haven't gotten the message yet, but I get that, you know, the, there's, there's probably still some naysayers out there, but the, the other part of the rest of it is, is, is it's very clear that, you know, this is a journey. One of the, one of the things that I see from other analyst firms, shall we say that, that kind of grates with me is this DevOps maturity model or a maturity model of any kind, because everybody's journey is going to be different, but it's the, you know, it's not adopted or adoptable company-wide immediately. Um, there's all sorts of other things that get in the way of it. And in a lot of cases, it has to be proven out still, even though there, you can look at other companies and look at how wonderful they are, you know, the Facebooks and Apples and all the other usual unicorns that everybody points to. But they have to see it work. And And, and the other part of that, is that if you do it wrong, the consequences for financial institution can be pretty mm -hmm. darn serious. Do so. it wrong or, you know, it, whether it's quality or just causing downtime in systems. Yeah. You know, I yeah. started my career in banking and uh, you quickly learn <laughs> accuracy <laughs> yeah. and uptime are, are yep. extremely important. Yep. And yep. you don't want to mess with either of those. You know, I think th the other thing about this is I thought we might have a little bit more on the lower end, the right end of the scale, just because in, at the high end, yes, financial institutions tend to be a big adopter of new technology and more on the leading edge of things um, because it, it makes a huge difference to their business. They're, they're very good at doing that. On the other side of it, you have a ton of legacy systems in the financial industry, a lot of mainframe. There's still some assembler and COBOL and 4GL code that I know I wrote in the I won't tell you what decade, but um, that I'm sure is still out there. You know, God forbid that poor bank, but um, you know, it, there's there's a there's a long lineage of applications, and they haven't all been replaced by any stretch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and that's that's a function of you know who knows how it is written and what can you actually do to it and how replaceable is it and, and stuff like that. And I, I I saw. A, uh, a statistic a couple of years ago that the investment model or investment window for systems of record, and this is mainframe, you know, that type of stuff is, is 25 to 30 years. And that's the stuff that's still mm -hmm. on COBOL, still on um, uh, DB2 and, and IMS and things like that. And these systems of engagement, engagement, the investment window on those is three to five years. So mm -hmm. all the cool stuff that's being done out on the edge and all that other stuff, it's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this now. We're going to burn it down and do it all over again in a short period of time, but we're still going to have this system of record stuff that we have to maintain because that's the family jewels. That's where, how these companies make their money, mm -hmm. so those types of things. So that's, that's interesting. You know, the, the, I, it, it's expected that these numbers are expected that, that there's different people are at different stages on all this. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we also looked at, and there, there are many more questions either. This is a uh, 
summation of some of the data and not all everything that we asked. But one of the things we want to get in a, a feel for is just really the maturity. And by the way, I don't know what analyst firm you could possibly be talking about, but that's all another topic. Um, <laughs> so we're sort of the, you know, the, uh, the GRC policies and, and standards that are impacting application delivery because it's changed, right? And I think that's maybe just as an aside, I, I think you and I both have independently made the observation that the regulatory frameworks, the pace of which that is not only happening, new things coming out, but them being able to uh, react to change in the industry is really significantly changed. So seeing these kind of numbers around well-defined, very well-defined in the 27 and 35% range, somewhat 25 and below, not too far off from what we were looking at before. So it's, it's, it's banking, it's finance, financial services. So we expect the regulatory frameworks to be pretty well known. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it mirrors kind of that, what we saw in the, in the previous one about, okay, it's about a third that are doing it really well. And the rest are kind of trailing along, catching up on that. Um, but it's still, you know, the not well-defined or not even sure for financial institutions, that, that that's a, that's a head scratcher for that's me. That's like, problematic. That is, that is problematic. And tell me which companies responded and I'll move my money away from them into someplace else, you know. New banks, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but but your point about the regulator, the regulators, I mean, they are scram absolutely scrambling to catch up with technology, the, the pace of technology development, as is everyone else. Um, and and there's, a, there's a, a fundamental sea change for the regulators to go from legalistic mindset and persona and and maybe even carrying a you know a, a law degree to technologists mm -hmm. who also have a legalistic view because there's there's so many ways that um you know they have to be understand if they're laying down a regulation they have to be able to understand can anybody a attain this level of compliance given the technology and they also have to understand where the bits are that where the where the ugly bits are, where the weak points are, um, in in the technology. So they're scrambling. You know, any any regulatory agency, you look at their their job requis requisitions, and it's all pretty much all technology heavy technology mm. background. I think everyone has to be a technologist or technology executive to some degree, right? Yeah. In our environment today, and and they. Yeah come to it because we use it in all our lives. And I imagine with the acceleration of digital experiences, digital technology adoption over the last 15, 18 months, the regulatory framework is even more challenged to keep up. So. Yep. Yep. And every new technology thingy that comes along just adds another, another layer of complexity to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, uh, different kind of regulations, regulatory frameworks um, can be both there's things you have to meet. You have to produce a report that you provide to someone or publish in some way externally. You know, financial reporting is, a, is an easy one, uh, for example. But there's also um, regulations and requirements that um, really are more attesting that you are applying this to your business. It's not you have to establish some big report that you put out on your in your in your, uh, in your board meeting or in, on your website or something like this. And that's what this question was really getting around is what application delivery focused, like there's lots of regulatory uh, landscape, but what things that apply to application delivery, uh, what percentage of them are internally uh, developed? What is kind of industry normal for our industry that you're in, in this case, financial services? Um, what things do you have third parties develop versus you know, you're doing your own interpretation of it and putting policies and processes in place. And, and do you, or do you live in all of the above? And certainly, you know, over almost a third, 28% said we're, we deal with all of it. Um, and a lot of it is industry standard, which I think fits perfectly right. with financial services, financing right. industry. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm a little, I mean, the, the one, shocker or minor surprise of the all of the above is only 28 percent i i should think that most of them deal with a combination of stuff mm -hmm. well yeah. and one of the things that happens in these surveys too is 
people answer for themselves or they answer for their company. And sometimes yeah, yeah, that yeah. will influence an answer like, well, I just deal with industry standard ones. I don't deal with you know, yeah. a, a security framework that we have to apply to, to meet whatever, you know. Right. Uh, and and especially with going back to that on their roles, maybe they're only, they're only responsible for this compliance to this regulation or this agency and not others. And, you know, everybody's got multiple ways of doing it. And each regulator, each regulator has their own way that they want to receive things as well. So that's mm -hmm. adds to the complexity of everything. Absolutely. Okay. So we're, we're getting into the, a little bit of the more of the meat here around how well our audit requirements communicated to the development organization. I can tell you when I was in banking, I didn't know anything about the regulations. I was nearly my career. You know, I hoped everybody, you know, the other people knew those things and, and uh, kept me from, you know, writing off the rails. You know, of course, a little different when you get farther down in your career, but um, I, I'm a little bit taken by how well people believe this is communicated, not defined, but communicated. In other words, they expect their people involved with software, uh, any part of that chain, uh, they understand, they know what the requirements are that's been communicated to them. Yeah. It, it, so, so there, there's communication and there's understanding and, and the ability to act upon that and, and know, I mean, ideally you want to know ahead of time as a developer, is this, is this going to be compliant? Oh, by the way, did the rules change from the last time I had a yeah, training session three months change. ago? And yeah. what about this thing here? And I just got these reports from the six SAS to NAS scanners that we run, and they're each 12 pages long, and there's all these red lines and flashing lights all over the place. Which one of these do I actually have to deal with? Mm -hmm. And which ones can I ignore? And, uh, da, 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 da. and, and I'm, what I'm doing is, is indicting this concept of shift left that you should have to, yes, you have to shift security left. You have to catch things sooner. But you're putting this huge burden on developers to understand what the regulations are, what is secure, what is compliant. They are coders. They're not regulators. They're not compliance people. And it also puts a burden on your security and compliance team to train the developers on this mm -hmm. stuff. And it puts a huge burden on your security and compliance teams to be able to coders because the developers say, hey, go write that stuff yourself if you want it so badly. And you know, so there, there's a huge, huge effort and, and gap in the communicating and actually being to execute on that. And that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that needs to be solved. Well, and I suspect some of this is we're a heavily regulated industry, heavily regulated company because of the business we're in and financial services. Everyone, you know, it's an aspect of their business where you might not have that as heavily in a different industry that is not so heavily regulated. So could be also the environment that we operate in. We all know right. lots of regulate now. The people whose jam is to read the you know the latest change to the you know can't wait to get to their email to to find out what's changed today. That's that's probably not the developers. I think I could yeah, say, yeah, say I, that. Yeah, yeah, that would be an easy bet on that. I don't the need other, a survey the, to tell me that. <laughs> no. The other part of this is the three right blocks that okay that tells me that yeah the people either don't want to know or or just they aren't being informed on in what this is and it's somebody else's job to catch the compliance and catch the security elsewhere. Yeah, or they just feeling that they're either not well enough informed or it's someone else's job to your point. Yeah. Yep. Great, well, let's let's dig in. We're kind of peeling the onion apart here, getting into a few layers uh, below. So next we looked at, you know, in. Of course, we need data. We need information to say whether we are in compliance, right? First of all, what do you need to collect? That was around that concept of is is the organization informed? Do they know what's expected of them? What we need to to determine if we're meeting requirements? Um, and is that done through automation, through tools? Do we we'll kind of label it DevOps tools for our purposes purposes here? As part of just the regular day to day process of delivering software. 
or, or it might be something that's extracted in a separate manual process. You know, I, I equate this to, uh, I said on another talk about co compliances. Are we dealing with the walk into the accountant's office with your shoebox of receipts? Or are we walking with all my stuff's uploaded and you can see it there? You know, wh wh which yeah. end of the spectrum are we on? So what is, what is your reaction to this? Because I have a few comments. <laughs> yeah, this this was the... Okay, let's let's go back to square one here. Let's We've got <laughs> thirty some odd people that are doing DevOps whole hog. We've been doing it for years, and another big chunk that yeah, we've been doing it for two to three years. And your ninety percent of people are still collecting data manually. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like why are you doing DevOps in the first place? Or more importantly, what do you think doing DevOps is? And and the, uh, so I suspect there's there's some things behind this, and I'll let, let you comment on, on some of it. But the you know the opening point I made is if you're doing DevOps right, this stuff is there for you. Right, you've got a common data model, you've got a repository, the data is persisted into the pipeline run, you've got audit reports and evidence reports and all the things in the can ready to go for anybody to pull whenever they want. Why is this still such a hugely manual effort? Well, one of the things I know from talking to to companies, you know, many companies, is it's that journey again. I mean, you start. There's a reason why you start down a DevOps journey, right? And it's not for compliance. It's I don't think in most cases, it's for delivering software and being more effective at delivering software um, functionality capabilities as the business requires, with it, no matter what kind of business you're in now, really. And as people move down that journey, they sort of get to the other aspects that you get more mature, of not just doing it, but thinking about how they can be more effective at it. Like, for example, it was, it was a couple of years ago that I went to uh, one of the DevOps conferences I was speaking at and not my panel, but there was a panel of compliance people from organizations, different kinds of organizations, an airline, a bank, I can't remember what all what. They were jazzed about DevOps because now development would talk to them, right? Because they have data. They, they don't have, you know, they may be manual to get it to them, but at least they had data in these tools. And, and, and in a way, one of, the, one of the people said, you know, they don't even realize what they're sitting on, this information that's valuable to us that can help us all do this easier. Well, as you as you, as you you continue down your DevOps journey, I think you get to those places where now, okay, yes, we've automated these things. We've gotten better at getting software out more quickly, more reliably. Uh, th there are, you know, we're getting into the metrics of this. Now we're getting into the compliance of this. So I think that's part of that, this response to me, Tim, is, is why are so many people still doing manually? Because that's how we have been doing it. And while we have automation, we don't have automation all the way to the end of the process, to the end of getting compliance information to people. At least that automation isn't in everybody's hands yet. I know that's, you know, a pro your product addresses that. Right, and, and I'll stay away from the product pitch on it. But the other thing yeah. that I take away from this, and in, in, um, off, off of your comment is, is perhaps security and compliance people are not the cool kids, so they're not invited to the meetings, oh, or, you know, <laughs> you know, or they're not even considered. You know, when we're doing DevOps, I can't you know, believe you would say such a thing. You got engineers and shared services trying to solve a problem to get software out the door, and the last people they want to talk to is the Department of No, which is the security and compliance people. So. Uh, again, you know, I assert if you're doing DevOps right, everybody's there. All of these considerations are part of your design of your, your, you know, the way you're designing your automation the, 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 and all of that stuff, all your dependencies, where the controls are. Everybody should have a seat at the table. Everybody should be respected and contributed in, and included in, in what the design is. And this type of stuff goes away from uh, mm -hmm. if you're doing it right. So let me flip the glass kind of half full. If you look at the right hand side of this, if you look at the balance of manual efforts and, and DevOps tool automation, of course, we don't know what that is 50, 50 right. or you know, 10, right. 10 and 90. 
and then the to the right, the purple box to the right, primarily through DevOps to automation and some manual efforts, efforts plus another 7.14, say most or all through DevOps tool. You're 50% of people who are getting that, some of that or a lot of that value. In the case of 20 plus seven, you know, you're 28% of the people are getting, you know, a lot of value out of their DevOps right. tools for compliance purposes. And I think right. we're going to see that show up here later to just kind of spoiler alert, right? I think we're going to see some of why or where that's happening. So it is, I think it is happening and it has, has improved. If, if we were sitting here, you know, eight years or seven years into DevOps and saying, you know, why is nobody, anybody taking advantage of this, Tim? You know, everybody's sitting yeah, over yeah. here at zero, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, if, if these numbers on the right were lower, I'd be really concerned. But yeah, you know, yeah, it is, it is uh, encouraging. And, and also this is the way, um, I'll talk a little bit later about a way of thinking about the cost of this compliance effort and how much of a huge resource drain it is for organizations. Um, and these folks on the right, especially the right two boxes, you've got some wonderful receipts to go and prove um, that this stuff works because- you know, Money you, was spent. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, your ops people, your shared services, even your product owners can say, hey, look how, ma how many more deployments you're doing, look how many more features we're releasing and all that other stuff, which is great. The business has to do that. But if it still comes at the expense of all this manual effort for compliance, you're not getting your optimal value out of that. So. Good point. Good point. Okay. Well, let's, let's go a little further. <laughs> so over the past three years, now we're talking about, so how, how is this impacted uh, for you as the evolution of your DevOps automation technology, as you've got progressed down that journey, increased or reduced your ability to meet governance compliance requirements. So we're, or is it the same, you know, you're kind of where you were, we're not really seeing a, you know, a hit taken from it. We're also not seeing a big gain. And this data says, no, they're seeing increases. I mean, you have 34.8% saying significantly increased our ability, mm -hmm. you know, so this is sort of the inverse of that last chart, right? It's right, the left hand right. side where, you know, even greater than, than we, than we said some or the balance of, or all or whatever, you know, folks that are saying here 34.8% and then on in the somewhat increased 44.6, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, close to two thirds, two third, three quarters of the people in the survey saying it's made a difference. And we can see from three years up back how things have changed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So there, there is potential there. I mean, a couple of things that I'd, you know, I'd like to arrange for a health check for those people over on the right, <laughs> on the right mm -hmm. columns where they've, they've gone backwards or they've not seen a difference. I'd love to come in and say, okay, show me what you're doing and how come you're not getting any value out of this? Because these others have the proof that they are getting value out of out of this, mm -hmm. and again, it may be it you know there there's um, kind of the well that's the way we've always done it before, and that that solving the compliance problem is not surfaced up high enough, or it's not within the the mental purview of the team that's doing DevOps because they may be looking to solve just the release and, and quality issues and that solving compliance is not their, is not their problem. Mm -hmm. So again, I'd like to go in and talk to these people. Okay. Why aren't you getting any value out of that? Please. Cause we can show you where you can get significant value out of this. Well, we, and we are asking sort of a three year picture. So if you just started, you know, this month, this quarter, yeah. whatever, yeah going down this process, you're not going to see low numbers on the right hand side. You're going to say, well, I'm investing. I'm not seeing the returns right. quite yet, but we've got a, enough time horizon to be able to show, you know, en enough um, kind of per perspective to be able to val validate if we're seeing a benefit or not. So I think it's really encouraging to see yeah. that kind of reaction. Yeah, I and mean, what would expect, you know, with the, with the the number of companies that are that are all in on DevOps, I would expect them to see that significant increase. And the ones that are still into it, yeah, they've seen some value. That's that's expected, and and that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. 
very much so. All right. So is your future DevOps automation roadmap expected to increase or decrease your ability to meet governance and compliance requirements? So now looking forward, you know, you have a plan of what you're doing with tools, what you're doing with automation, what you're doing with measurement and metrics and, you know, delivering software in uh, a new, more rapid fashion. You know, what is your expectation on uh, how well that's going to improve? So have you tapped out? Have you gotten what you think you're going to get out of this DevOps thing in terms of compliance? Or no, we see there's a lot of gas left in the tank. We half said, yeah, there's a lot left, you know, yeah. in, in, in 41% saying somewhat. So that tells me, even though we're seeing some pretty nice benefits, um, that we're kind of just scratching the surface. Yeah, yeah, we can do. There's, there's more, more to be had there, and and the uh, and and I, you know, I would expect this type of response that there's always more because the the DevOps is a the never ending journey. There's always something else you can improve. Always something else you can do a little better, and go find it. No, it is about a continuous improvement. Yep. Absolutely. Continuous learning. Um, I think there was something I was going to ask you your thoughts about this too, is um, one of the things this data doesn't tease out directly is something we mentioned earlier, and that is how rapidly things are changing. So when you ask that, when we ask that three-year question, you know, what's changed over those three years? The regulatory landscape has not stayed fixed. Matter of fact, it's changed drastically. Yeah. Right. And and I think we're looking, I think we'd all intuitively agree it's going to continue to just like delivering software is continue to be faster and faster. The regulatory changes and complexity is going to increase significantly. Right. So I wonder if people are saying, well, we've seen some good things. Um, I'm glad we can be optimistic because the future looks pretty complex. Yeah, it, it, the more you know, the more there is to know, and I, I think that's that's always it's going to be this inverted pyramid of of data and information that you have to process and and allow for and factor into whatever processes you're doing, whether it's just basic compliance effort or um, developing software or whatever it is you're going to be doing, there's, there's always going to be more things. And then you add in new form factors, like who, who, who thought you could, um, you know, a, a dumb cell phone could be your bank account 10 years ago, but in the major portions mm -hmm. of the world, it is because they don't have retail mm -hmm. banks anywhere nearby or whatever. So, um, you know, there's always going to be some other technological change that's going to require additional change from regulators and so forth. I mean, you know, you look at PayPal disrupted the credit cards. Well, Venmo's disrupting PayPal and there's something that's going to come along and disrupt Venmo and, and all that other stuff. So that's, that's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. Agree very much. Okay. Let's take another look here. Is the data being gathered by DevOps automation tools making your ability to satisfy the ask of auditors easier or more cumbersome? In other words, looking, this is looking at from the people you've got to give this information to. You've got to provide data, information, stats, process, whatever it might be uh, about your compliance. Um, is, it, is that data being gathered helpful? The things that you're, using, that you're able to do through automation um, with DevOps? And a pretty strong answer, you know, kind of what, similar to what we saw, maybe a little bit different proportions on the front end, but significantly easier, somewhat easier. Again, we're looking at three quarters yeah. of folks saying, yeah, it's different. And, 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 and in a way, it's sort of kind of intuitively obvious. If the data is there and you know it's there, you can get it to it. Now, it's a matter of does the tool make it easy? Or are you creating the data lake to do it? Or, you know, how do you get it there? How do you get it in a form? Right. Um, but whatever that is, whether it's easy through a tool or you have to do more efforts on your, it, that effort is worth it in paying off is what I yeah. see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's expected. We're doing this stuff. There's, here's one of the expected benefits and we're actually realizing that expected benefit. And yeah, there's still some pessimists over there on the right, but, you know, we won't, <laughs> won't worry about them. 
Uh, but you know that, that's the whole point is of you know doing DevOps or moving up to the next stage of value stream management. It's based on data and information and the ability to not only access it but understand it so you can do something about it. Um, so there's lots of beneficiaries of, of this, not only auditors and compliance people like what we're talking about here, but other other constituents. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was a corollary question that we asked um, that I don't have on a slide here. It was how well did GRC standards or policies, how well are they codified into your DevOps tools, your automation tools and strategy that you currently use? And it was a real mix across the board. Um, probably the heaviest, I think, was close to about 27%, if I remember right. So that um, some are implemented, you know, it's kind of lower end of the scale. Another 18% said minimal or none. So you're talking about a pretty pretty high percentage there. And then the rest of the folks were, you know, about half or significant or most, you know, so a good chunk there as well. So. Uh, given you're in the product space in this area, what do you see that organizations have to do to go from what's in the tool to filling in the gap with the rest? Is it more about configuring the tools that you have to be able to do that? So you've got to invest in that, or is it just things that either tools are not able to give you out or you're not going to get it from a DevOps tool? Well, it, it's the, there, there's a number of ways to unpack that. And, and one is, you know, right tool for the right job. I don't use a socket to drive an ale into, you know, into a board. You wouldn't use your static analysis tool to try to codify or make a defensible decision about releasing or not releasing. You know, it comes back and gives you some kind of statement that there, yes, there is a vulnerability in this coat, in this packet of coat. And we determine it's a critical vulnerability. Okay, what's the context of that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's in this packet of code. Okay, does that code ever get executed? Or is it, is that code or that vulnerability only uh, say you've got an open connection to the internet? Great, that's a bad thing. Yes, it's a bad thing. However, in the context of the pipeline, this is only in our secure our testing environment, which has no connection to the internet. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the big challenges that that um, you know you face of how do you codify this into your uh, into your DevOps tools into your pipelines and so forth, which you know brazen product pitch you know we do with with a new product but I, I don't want to go too much into that right now but the you know understanding the context understanding the severity understanding the impact and what's that do to delivery schedules what's that do from our risk profile those all have to be factored into the go and no go so your business owner the application owner whoever's in charge of that thing that you're releasing has to understand what their appetite for risk is the CISO has to understand that. And all the engineers and everyone else in the process, shared services have to understand what is introducing risk and what is our appetite for that and how do we mitigate that risk, preferably ahead of time. Um, and there's risk all the way through into production because you know you don't just you know you don't have the pizza and, and put on the t-shirts after you release into production. Things can change out in production. Mm -hmm. Over and above simply um, a, uh, you know, a vulnerability being discovered post-release, you know, that happens, that happens all the time, but there's other things in, in cloud environments. Can somebody go in and change something? And if somebody does, is that within compliance? Do we want to know about it? And then you get to the issue of what do we do about it? Um, you know, do you have feature flags enabled so you can shut something off immediately? So you've got a mean time to mitigate of zero so that you can close the gap between mean time to discover and mean time to repair. You can at least provide yourself some air cover that way. Um, if it's another type of compliance vulnerability or, or exposure that gets, what is your response? 
how is that factored into everything that you've that you've done? And again, I'm going to go indict the shift left mentality because it, it's it's like all the stuff over on the here on the right magically is going to take care of himself if we do all the stuff over here on the left, and that ain't so. So that's it's kind of a long-winded way of getting around to you know there, this is the comp delivering software is very complex. Being compliant and being secure is very complex, and it touches the development of the software, the delivery of the software, and the software while it's in production. So you have to look at it from that standpoint um, if you want to be you know the next level of excellence. You know, I, the thing I would add to that, Tim, is there's having data and there's having being able to identify what's meaningful data. In other yes. words, uh, what matters, right? And, and that, I think that's a lot of the effort that or, that I've seen that organizations have to go through is we can pull, it's sort of like the early vulnerable code, vulnerability management, you know, attacks on our networks. You know, I, we could see thousands, now you can see hundreds of thousands of those per minute happening. Um, but what didn't matter, you know, like you said, if, if you aren't executing that portion of code, that's probably not where your biggest issue is right now. If that code never gets executed, even if it does have a vulnerability in it. That said, on the other side of it, if you're working in a very fluid environment, software is code, infrastructure is code, excuse me. Um, and the stack is changing, the environment's changing, couldn't be manual, but also could be highly automated. Um, that's different too, right? Now you need all this context around, well, that was the data at the time and the meaning of that. I need to know these parameters to be able to say whether this influences compliance or non-compliance. So right. I guess what I'm saying is the complexity of, of our environment, the its ability to morph and change uh, very quick, quickly, um, you know, constantly, all makes for a, a very technically challenging as well as compliance challenging environment to say now right. are we compliant were we compliant are we going to be compliant yeah and again trying to rely on people to understand and manage and catch and assure and attest all that stuff is really hard mm -hmm. and if that's what you're trying to do then you should take a look at other ways of doing it. And that's, and that's where a lot of automation comes in because you can codify a lot of that stuff into the immutable artifacts that you're using and the ability to catch and detect drift when somebody's gone off page and made, made a little change just so it worked in their environment. Well, no, that's, that ain't working. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's not going to work in production or that's not going to fly in production or whatever. So you have all of that, but then there's another layer underneath that of the things that your pipeline can't control. Um, you have to have systems and, and automation at that level as well to, to capture all that and manage that. Interesting. Well, um, so we're coming up on our, we got about 10 minutes left in our hour with everyone. So we're, our timing is not too bad on, on our slides. Let me pull that down here just for a second. Um, there were some other interesting findings in the data too. And I thought one of them, Tim, was we asked a question around what share of compliance and governance incidents are identified in real time, meaning, you know, in the flow of doing the work of creating software by development teams. And the numbers were pretty good. I mean, it, it, we saw if I added up the 50% of the time or greater to 100% or most of the time, how often is that being found by development teams? Sort of your shift left, right? It's shift left without having to be a compliance expert. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about in the 67, 68% range for, for that half and above. So a lot of, a, a lot of organizations are seeing things happening earlier in the process in terms of identifying compliance issues that can, of course, you know, in theory be fixed earlier, right? You at least hope that the, the ones that matter are being fixed. I'm curious from your perspective, does that surprise you at all? Um, no, it, it's, it's encouraging um, because, you know, one of the, one of the things I mean, we've been harping on, you talked to some of the other, mavens and devops for years is you have to have a culture where that's acceptable and you know you're not going to get your 
head handed to you if you report a problem. And the company and the and the mm. stakeholders have to have um, the maturity and the courage to say to accept that when a problem is reported, you need to deal with it. You you don't sweep it under the rug. And there's plenty of examples you can point to recently of you know a verb creating security breaches that where that's what they you know people were afraid to report stuff and they were afraid to 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 deal with it for fear of it going public and stuff like that if 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 you're afraid to report a problem and take action on it it's a hot market go find someplace else <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah, I mean, the uh, I was talking with one customer recently that um, they they have a compliance initiative generated out of the engineering group, which surprised the socks off of me. And it was driven from the fact that they failed some um, accessibility standards, some global accessibility standards, and somebody in Canada took them to court and they had to pay a whole lot of money because the screen reader didn't work or the, the something else didn't work. So now they're, they're having to do that. But they're, okay, we got popped. We don't want to get popped again. That's an easy way. That's an easy one to justify. But when it's a, a oh, good grief, this is a bad thing. We need to stop this and fix it. Somebody is saying it's more important to release. That's a bit. That's a that's a toxic situation. You you can't. That's one. It's not sustainable, and two. It's really stupid. Because if it's going to come and bite you in the backside, it will, and it will in a big way. And somebody may you know the jail time or fines or everything else that has to go along with that. You have to be open about it. You have to be quick about it because you if you catch it, especially if you, before you've released it. You know, if it takes a day longer or a week longer to fix it, that is no big deal. And if it's going to take you longer, well, if you've done feature flags, it's still not going to impact your release. You know, maybe that feature not getting out, but you can, you don't have to can the release just because one thing isn't working or there's vulnerability. You just have it shut off until you get it fixed. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so there, again, there's a maturity of your DevOps processes, but there's a maturity of the culture that is there and, and these numbers are encouraging that yeah people are actually feeling confident enough and brave enough that they can raise their hand and say this sorry this this needs to be fixed beforehand well and we're no longer we no longer live in an environment of it's going to be three months before we get another release out to fix that right so we yeah. can react quickly and I, th I think what i was thinking about as you were talking about there tim is that Part of that culture is saying it's, it's the um, lack of reprisal or what the right word is uh, yeah. <laughs> for consequences, you know, for reporting something. But it's also the, the culture of looking at, um, OK, great, that's something we can quickly resolve and get back out. Thanks to what we've invested in in creating a DevOps process to be able to release software in smaller pieces could be because also you're taking a cloud native approach or you've segmented off a portion of the application and and containerized parts of it. So there DevOps is part of this, but it's also, you know, how you've architected and how you're working with your legacy applications in a kind of DevOps world, mainframe or not, uh, to be able to re react quickly. It's kind of, you know, it's, um, it, what was it? I think it was Mike Tyson said, you know, it's all good to get hit by that first punch. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's all, yes. it's all, then that's when it starts to hurt. So you want to be able to, to quickly respond right now. Yeah. Yeah. Defense is ready or whatever it is. Yeah. I hope I'm not uh, voting. I, I don't want to get Mike Tyson mad at me, but yeah, well, I, I don't, I, you know, I tell my Eagle Scouts when they, when they bring a, a project to me, I said, you know, no, no battle plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. So, you know, you have to be able to, you have to expect that things are going to go wrong and you have to be able to, to respond to it. So it's not what happens. It's what you do with what happens. That's important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Very the culture so. is changing and, and, yeah, the more everybody is 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 an integral component, not only the tools, but the people are integral components of that process. 
the easier it is for all this stuff to happen the way it should. And we mm -hmm. all say it should happen. So we're, we're coming up on our time. We've got about six minutes left. Last thing I wanted to bring up um, is there was also some information in the data around um, kind of lack of well-integrated tools in the application delivery pipeline and how that creates fragmentation of data. So just like it's, you know, what data matters, it's also, you know, it's not all in one place and that's part of that effort. And I think that may have also contributed to some of those responses around where people are and their ability to really leverage the data that's there you know, knowing what's there, what's the right data that's meaningful. And then, you know, there, there may be six different there's to pull it all together into one cohesive or useful form right. that you can actually do compliance with. Right. The more, the more fragmented your, your software delivery supply chain is, the harder it is for everybody to do their job in including the compliance people. Cause there's, mm. there's data. One of the other ones we didn't show was how do you provide the the data to uh, to the regulators and was it a big chunk was the raw data i mean that's a that's a that's a yeah. hmm, that tells you exactly what you think of those people <laughs> <laughs> that's the shoe box of receipts right? yeah that's the here you figure it out you know here's the data so there's data there's information and there's knowledge and if you don't have a connected tool set you've just got data and somebody's got to figure it out and then if it is connected yeah, that's information. The next stage is what in the context of where everything is, that's where you get into the knowledge and the wisdom part of it. Mm -hmm. And you'll get there. You know, the, the, the more the more mature you are, the the better you are at DevOps, the more comprehensive you are at, at DevOps, and including all the all the all the teams and stakeholders, the 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 easier you will be to get to that level of knowledge and and uh, and and wisdom. Well, good. I want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, we want to talk to uh, who our gift card winners are. <laughs> okay. okay so. And that's not me, right? Darn. It's not you or I. We, you know, uh, f friends, family, and employees can't win. And, and, and moderators and hosts and guests on webinars don't get to win either. So our winner of the four Amazon gift cards are John P., uh, Padmanjani, if I'm saying that right, uh, D, and then Jose C, and Tim P. So the good folks at DevOps.com, Textron Group, will be getting a hold of you to uh, get those gift cards to you. Uh, well, let me give you the, the parting thought here, uh, Tim, if you want to say, say what's your takeaway. Uh, you, were, you were the business leader kind of commissioning this work, and um, I appreciate what your thoughts are and the value you're getting out of the tech strong research well the, the the thing to consider about compliance is there's there's a, a cost of time there's a hard dollar labor cost of the people doing the work but there's also an opportunity cost of those people because they're not adding any value compliance work is zero value add and the more people you have devoted to doing that the less innovation that you can deliver so and it, we call it the compliance tax. So if you figure out what you're paying in a compliance tax, you can justify the move into automating much more of this stuff. So, um, and it'll make everyone's life easier. Very good. And I, I'll, I will also compliment you on uh, being disciplined about not talking about products. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, folks didn't sign on for a pitch, yep. but obviously. I, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Love people to check out uh, Cloud Bees and also visit TechStrongResearch, both dot coms. Um, we are issuing a full report on this that'll be coming out in the next few weeks. And everybody that signed up, registered for this event, uh, will get a notification when that's ready. Um, and we'll uh, we look forward to producing some even fuller picture of this information. I think a lot of folks will get value from it. So. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate you right, being you. the kind of co-speaker today. And thank you to our audience and, of course, uh, to our tech team and uh, the folks behind the scenes at uh, TechStrong Group helped put this on for you. So on behalf of myself, and thanks again to CloudBees for commissioning the research and sponsoring today's webinar. We appreciate you spending an hour of your time with us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.